Welcome to Excellent Grades Academy. This is Dr. Bison EM. Today, we're looking at the human skeletal anatomy. Human skeleton, an introduction to the bones in the body. Without further ado, let's get into this. So introduction to the skeletal system. So the human skeleton has a total of 206 bones in an adult human being. Babies are born with about 270 to 300 bones, some of which will eventually fuse, for example, the hip bones to form the 206 bones that they have as adults. One thing I will tell you in this topic is that it's a very interesting topic Stay tuned, it's going to be very long and we're going to explore all the characteristics of bones and all the bones in the human body. So, What are the functions of the skeleton? Number one, protection of body's delicate organs such as the brain, spinal cord, the heart and the lungs. So when you look at these visceral organs, they are inside of protective cavities that are lined by bones. So the first thing is protection. Second thing is support and locomotion. The skeleton supports your body as you stand and locomotion movement. Number three is calcium storage and release. So your calcium is stored in your bones and if there is an adequate amount of calcium in the body, that calcium can be retrieved from your bones and can be released into circulation. Classification of the skeletal system. The human skeleton is divided into two parts. This is very important. Number one, the axial skeleton. We call it the midline skeleton. I'll be showing you pictures very, very soon. The axial skeleton has 80 bones. And secondly, the appendicular skeleton, I call it the peripheral skeleton, has 126 bones. So this is our guy here taking a selfie, striking a pose for a picture. <laughs> okay, that was a joke. So this is the human skeleton. This is him again here asking us why we are studying him. So this is the human skeleton. This is a human skeleton from the anterior view, the posterior view, and from the lateral views. Now, let's go deep into exploring what the actual skeleton is and what the appendicular skeleton is. So, this is the actual skeleton here, the midline skeleton. So, everything that is in the midline body is the actual skeleton. So, you've got this bone here. We'll be talking about it very soon. This bone here, these bones, and this bone here. The appendicular skeleton makes up our upper limbs. These are our upper limbs. So these upper limbs and our lower limbs. So these are our lower limbs. And these bones that serve as attachment of the limbs to the axial skeleton. So these bones here are what we call gedos. So this is the pelvic gedo, and this is the pectoral gedo. We'll look at them in detail as we go on. This is a schematic diagram that is simply showing us the skeleton again here in blue, and the appendicular skeleton here in blue. All right, so if we separate, separate them now, the actual skeleton will be this part of the bones, just con consisting of the skull, the vertebra, and the ribs. And the appendicular skeleton will be the pectoral guido here, the upper limb, the pelvic guido here, and the lower limb. So this is a very beautiful diagram that will show you what the actual skeleton is and what the appendicular skeleton is. You combine these two skeletons, then you have the full skeleton of the human 
being. All right. So this is just the anterior view and the posterior view of the actual skeleton. So anterior view of the actual skeleton and the posterior view of the actual skeleton. So now, if we were to label all the bones in the general skeleton, this is how it would be. So our actual skeleton has got the skull, the mandible, the sternum, it has the ribs and the vertebral column. This is our actual skeleton. Our appendicular skeleton will have the, the pectoral guido, which consists of the clavicle and the scapula. The first bone of the upper limb is called the humerus, the ulna, the radius, the carpal bones, the metacarpals, and the phalanges, which are also called the fingers. So when we move inferiorly, we have the sacrum, which is part of the vertebral column, and then we have the pelvic guido, it's called the pelvic, the pelvic bones, which consists of this bone here, called the ilium. Okay, so the ilium and the other bones of the pelvic, pelvic uh, guido we're going to see, the, the femur, the patella, the tibia, the fibula, the tassels, the metatarsals, the phalanges. All right, so this is just the skeleton, the diagram showing us the skeleton. Now, what are the types of bones? What are the types of bones that consist the skeleton? So, bones in the skeleton can be classified into five types based on the shape. So, the first one is the long bone. So, long bones are here. Then, in an example of a long bone, the humerus, okay, the bone of the, the arm. Also, these bones here, the bone of the thigh, this is called the femur. So bones that are longer than they are wide are what we call long bones. And then we have short bones. Short bones are very wide than, than they are long. Those are short bones. And then another classification type is that they are flat bones. Flat bones like the sternum, they're very long, but the... 3D dimension is very thin. They are not thick at all. They are very thin bones. Irregular bones do not have a regular shape. They are irregular, like the vertebrae bones. They are irregular. And then sesamoid bones are these types of bones like the, the, the patella. So these are the five types of bones based on the shape. The long bones, the short bones, the flat bones, irregular bone, sesamoid bone. Everyone is supposed to know this classification and where these types of bones are found. All right. So this is just literature that is telling us about the long bones, the short bones, the flat bones, and the irregular bones. All right. So let's move on. Okay. Let's move on and look at what we call bony surface markings so the bones in the body have got markings on them okay so bony surface markings are simply structural features adapted for specific functions most of these bony markings are absent at birth but they develop in response to certain forces and are most prominent in the adult skeleton so this is very important for you to know that bony sub markings, surface markings, are not common in at birth or in babies. Remember, when babies are born, are born, most of their bones are formed of cartilage. They have not yet ossified, so they do not have these bony surface markings. As a result, these bony surface markings are found in the adult skeleton. They are found in the adult skeleton. So let's look at the types of surface markings that are found in our bones. Number one, the depressions and the openings. So the depressions and the openings allow the passage of soft tissues or they form joints. Secondly, we have the processes, the projections or the outgrowths that either help form the joints 
or serve as attachment points for connective tissue. Let's look at these surface markings in details. The depressions and the openings allow the passage of soft tissues. Examples of soft tissues we have nerves, blood vessels, ligaments, tendons, or muscle attachment. The types of depressions and openings. Number one, we have the fissure. So the fissure is simply a narrow slit between adjacent parts of the bones. Okay, that's the fissure. Just a narrow slit between the adjacent parts of the bones. And then we have the foramen, which is just an opening. An opening within the bone is called a foramen. So we're going to see most of these foramens, especially in the skull. The bones that make up the head. There are a lot of foramen there. The fossa is a shallow depression on the bones. For example, the coronoid fossa of the humerus. Just a shallow depression on the bone is called the fossa. Let's move on to a sulcus. A sulcus is like a furrow along the bony surface. Okay? Just a furrow along the bony surface. A meatus is a passageway. So along the bone, there is a passageway like a tunnel in the bone. That's what we call a meatus. Okay. Now let's move on and look at processes, projections, and outgrowths on the bone. So the processes that form joints on the bones, number one, the condyle. So the condyle is a large round protuberance with a smooth articular surface at the end of the bone. For example, the lateral condyle of the femur. So we're going to, I'll be showing you these uh, processes very soon so that you appreciate them. The other process that is very important is called the facet. So the facet is a smooth, flat, slightly concave or convex articular surface. For example, the superior articular surface of the vertebra. So remember, a facet is simply a smooth, flat, slightly concave or convex articular surface. An articular surface is where something attaches. The other process is the head, which is usually just rounded, an articular projection supported on the neck of the bone. For example, the head is the head of the femur. And then let's look at processes that form attachment points for connective tissue. So we've got the crest, we've got the epicondyle, the line, mostly we call it the linear, the trochanter, the tubercle, and the tuberosity. Okay. Now let's look at the axial skeleton, the bones of the axial skeleton. This is an interesting part. Let's start with the skull. Okay. So bones of the axial skeleton are the following that I've listed here. So from top to bottom, we've got the skull, which is also called the cranium. And then we have got the vertebral column. Posteriorly, we've got the sternum anteriorly and the ribs so this the one that is in gold right now in this diagram is what we call the actual skeleton so we've got the skull the skull has got 22 bones the, the skull is separated into the cranium which is also called the calvaria and the face the cranium is made up of eight bones and the face is made up of 14 bones and then from the skull, so these, these 8 and 14 bones are besides the bones that are associated with the ear, which are the ossicles. There are 6 bones in the ear, 3 on each side, and you've got the hyoid bone. So from the skull, in total, we have about 29 bones. 29 bones in total on the skull. Then we have the sternum anteriorly here, this part here. It's called the sternum. And we have the ribs that are attached to the sternum. 
Some of them are not attached to the sternum. They are attached from the sternum anteriorly and they run posteriorly and attach to the vertebrae. They are 24 ribs in total. So the number of bones in total on the thoracic region of the axioskeleton are 25. Then we have the vertebrae here. It's called the vertebral column, which is made up of different parts as we are going to see. Let's move on. The skull or the cranium. The skull is the bony framework of the head. So the skull is the bony framework of the head. It consists 22 bones, not counting the bones of the middle ear. And it rests on the superior end of the vertebral column. So when you are standing, the skull is the superior most bone of the skeleton. So the bones of the skull are grouped into two categories. We've got the cranial bones and the facial bones. The cranial bones are those that cover your brain. The facial bones are the bones that make up your face. The cranial bones form the cranial cavity or the calvaria, which encloses and protects the brain. The eight cranial bones are the frontal bone, the two parietal bones, the two temporal bones, and the occipital bone, the ethmoid bone, and the sphenoid bone. So we're going to look at these eight bones of the cranial cavity and we'll, we'll point exactly where they are found on the skull. There are 14 facial bones that form the face. These include the two nasal bones, the two maxilla, two zygomatic bones, the mandible, two lacrimal bones, two palatine bones, two inferior nasal conche, and the vomer bone. Okay, so this is our skull here, and it's separated into this upper part here called the calvaria. It encloses the brain and these bones that make up the face. I put a very good 3D diagram so that you can appreciate the skull. So this is the skull. It's made up of the calvaria here and it has the face. The bones of the face. This is the lateral view. This is the lateral view of our skull. Okay, now let's move on. So these are the bones of the skull. The, the, the bone that makes your forehead here is what we call the frontal bone. The frontal bone. Then the bone on the side here, this one that is in pink, is what we call the parietal bone. So the parietal bone and the frontal bone has got a joint here. This joint is called the coronal suture. Okay, the coronal suture. Let me look at another diagram that shows a very good diagram. So these are the bones of the of the skull. So these bones that I've highlighted here make up the calvary. So we've got the frontal bone, the parietal bone, this side, there's another side, there's another part, that side, that's why there are two here. And then we've got this bone that is orange here, called the temporal bone. We've got the sphenoid bone, the ethmoid bone, and the occipital bone. So in total, there are eight cranial bones that you need to know from the skull. Okay. So that was the lateral view of the skull. This is the anterior view of the skull. Okay, so this is the frontal bone. This is the parietal bones. This is the sphenoid bone. This one in green here. So it starts from outside and it continues inside here. The sphenoid bone. This is the temporal bone. And behind is the occipital bone of the skull. Bones of the face include. This is the maxilla, and then this is the mandible, the zygomatic bone, 
is here. All right. So these are the bones of the skull. This is a simplified diagram. As you can see, this is the frontal bone here. This is the parietal bone right here. This is the maxilla here. And then this is the mandible. So the skull, the cranial and the facial bones protect and support special sense organs and the brain. So besides forming the large cranial cavity, the skull also forms several small cavities, like the nasal cavity, the nose, where your air come, goes in and goes into your trachea, the orbits that form the eyes, the paranasal sinuses, and small cavities which house organs in hearing and equilibrium. So let's just go back. What they mean here is that the skull also forms this cavity here. This is called the orbit, where your eyes are. And then this here is the nasal cavity, which is used for smell. On the other side, on the temporal bone, this is a temporal bone, there is a cavity that houses the organs for hearing. Okay, So the bones of the skull are fused together by what we call immovable joints called sutures. So immovable joints called sutures, which fuse most of your skull bones. The skull provides large areas of attachment for muscles that move various parts of the head. The skull and the facial bones provide attachments for muscles that produce facial expressions. So for you to produce facial expressions, the skull provides attachment for muscles of facial expression. So the, the bones of the cranial cavity, which we've already looked at, the frontal bone, which forms the forehead, the parietal bones forms the sides and the roof of the cranial cavity, the temporal bones form the lateral aspect and floor of the cranium, the occipital bone forms the posterior part and most of the base of the skull. We've got the ethmoid bone, which lies at the middle part of the base of the skull, and the ethmoid bone, located on the midline in the anterior part of the cranial floor, medial to the orbits. So I've already shown you this diagram, which shows the bones of the skull. So this is the uh, now, if you cut the skull in cross section, this shows you the bones of the skull. So this is the frontal bone. This is the ethmoid bone. It has what we call the cribriform plate, which has got foramina, where the uh, bipolar neurons of uh, smell pass through to form the olfactory bulb, which is a bulb that is used for smells. And then this is the sphenoid bone. It is butterfly shaped. Okay, so this is a temporal bone. These are parietal bones and this is the occipital bone. So these are the, uh, the these are the bones of the skull. These are the bones of the cranium of the skull that protects the brain. So this is a schematic diagram showing you the same bones I've been showing you. Frontal bone, parietal bones, the temporal bone, occipital bone, the sphenoid bone, the ethmoid bone. Okay. And then these are the bones of the face of the skull. It's diagram showing you same bones in sagittal view. Sagittal view. So you have to know the bones of the skull, both in cross section and in sagittal view, how they appear. Bones of the skull from a superior angle. Okay. So this is a very good diagram because it shows you how the frontal bones and the parietal bones are attached together. You are using these immovable joints that we call sutures. So the joint between a frontal bone and the two parietal bones is what we call 
the Corona Sutra. So this is the Corona Sutra. And the Sutra attaching the two parieto bones is what we call the Sagittal Sutra. The Sagittal Sutra. The joint that is attaching the two parieto bones to the occipital bone is what we call the Lambda. Or the Lambdoid Sutra. It's called the Lambdoid Sutra. Where the, the Sagittal Sutra and the Lambdoid Sutra meeting is called the lambda it is called the lambda and then where the corona sutra and the sagittal sutra are meeting is what we call the bregma it's called the bregma there's another point here where four bones meet where the pareto bone the frontal bone and the temporal bone meet that is called the terion okay so these are the bones of the skull from the posterior from the posterior view. Okay. Now I want you to pay particular attention to the occipital bone. So the occipital bone has got this process here. It's called the external occipital protuberance. And they, there are lines leading away from the occipital, external occipital protuberance that we call the superior nuchal line. And then below it, we have the inferior nuchal lines. So these are very important because they provide attachment to so many muscles. So you're going to see the muscles that attach to these processes and surface markings when we start doing muscles. So this is just a diagram showing you the bones that we've been talking about for the skull. Okay. Now let's look at the facial bones of the skull. We've looked at the bones of the calvaria of the skull. Let's shift our focus to the facial bones of the skull. So we've got nasal bones that form the bridge of the nose. We've got the maxilla that form the upper jaw bone. If you look at the upper jaw bone, that is formed by the maxilla and it forms most of the hard palate when you open your mouth the superior part of your mouth is called the hard palate it is formed by the maxilla zygomatic bones form cheekbones so they form the prominences of the cheek lacrimal bones form a part of the medial wall of each orbit okay. then the inferior nasal concha form a part of the inferior lateral wall of the nasal Cavity. Then we have the vomer that forms the inferior portion of the nasal septum, the mandible, which is the lower jaw. It is the largest and the strongest facial bone, the only movable skull bone. All the bones in the skull are not movable except the mandible. The nasal septum divides the anterior, the interior of the nasal cavity into the right and the left sides okay so in a case where you have a broken nose in most cases it refers to that the nasal septum has been damaged okay the orbits is just the eye socket the foramina is the openings for blood vessels nerves and ligaments of the skull let's focus on the 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 facial bones of the skull now so you have got the nasal bone here and then you've got the zygomatic bone, which is called the cheek bone. You've got the maxilla. The maxilla is your upper jaw. Then you've got the mandible. The mandible is the lower jaw and the only immovable joint, the bone of the, the face. All right. Zoom in. Another diagram that shows us these bones at a very superior level. The frontal bone we've already talked about, this was part of the calvaria. The nasal bone here forms the nose bridge. Then you've got the lacrimal bone, the ethmoid bone. Then you've got the nasal septum, which divides our nasal cavity into two, the left and the right. We have the vomer, the maxilla, the zygomatic bone, which is the cheekbone. And this bone is not labeled here. 
This is the mandible, the largest, strongest, and only movable bone of the face. Let's zoom in into the maxilla. So this is the maxilla. The maxilla has got a frontal process. So this frontal process goes and joins the frontal bone. So this process that is going and joins the frontal bone is what we call the frontal process of the maxilla. And then we've got this here. It's got the zygomatic process. So this process of the maxilla goes and joins the cheekbone, which is the zygomatic bone. So this is the part that we're referring to here. This is the zygomatic process of the maxilla. Okay. So this is the nasal crest. crest. The nasal crest. This nasal crest here is what joins with the vomer to connect to the nasal septum. This is the nasal notch. It forms the inferior part of the nasal cavity. Okay. This is the infraorbital foramen where nerves will pass through. And then this part here is called the alveolar process of the maxilla. That's where teeth go and lodge in. So the alveolar process of the maxilla is where your teeth, your upper teeth, will lodge into the bone of the maxilla. Let's look at the mandible. The mandible is a very interesting bone and it's very high yield. So everyone is supposed to know the mandible. This is called the coronoid process. This is called the condylar process. The mandibular notch, this is the ramus of the mandible. The angle of the mandible is very palpable even in living human beings. When you open your mouth, where your jaws are very prominent, that's the angle of the mandible. And then it has the body, which has the mental foramen, nerves pass through here. This is the alveolar process of the mandible where your lower teeth lodge into the mandible. So that was the axilla and the mandible. Let's look at the nasal septum bones. So the nasal septum bones are formed by these bones here. So anteriorly, you've got the nasal septal cartilage. The nasal septal cartilage. Posteriorly, you've got the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. The perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and the posterior most, you've got the sphenoid bone, which has got air sinuses here. These are air spaces. Okay. These are air spaces. The skull of a child is different from that of an adult because the sutures, those joints that we said were immovable joints between two bones, in children, the sutures are not fused. And the reason why these sutures are not fused in children is to allow for brain development in children. Brain development in children. And another clinical corollary is that the sutures are not closed because there is a molding when being born. The heads are big and they have to pass through the vagina. So the head has to be compressed a little bit. That is what we call molding. So sutures are not fused because of, number one, there is need for brain development. The brain has to grow. Number two, for molding during birth. Okay. So now there's a space when a child is born between the parietal bones and the frontal bone. This space is seen because it has a beating action on children. This is called the anterior fontanelle. The anterior fontanel. From the anterior fontanel, when you come inferiorly, between the junction of the parietal bone, the frontal bone, the sphenoid bone, and the temporal bone, you've got the anterior lateral fontanel. The anterior lateral fontanel. Posteriorly to these fontanels, you've got the posterior fontanel between the parietal bones and the occipital bone. And you also have the posterior lateral fontanel between the occipital bone, the parietal bone, and the temporal bone. So these 
very important for brain development in a child. They close at about 6 to 18 months in children. Now, let's look at the vertebral column. So that was the skull and all the bones. Now, let's look at the vertebral column. The vertebral column is this structure here. It consists of four parts. Okay, the other part is fused. So it has this part here. So it's called the cervical region, the thoracic region, the lumbar region, and you've got the sacrococcygeal region. So this is the, the lateral view of the vertebral column. This is the anterior view. And this is the posterior view of the vertebral column. Let's get into this. Okay. So the vertebral column suspends the skull superiorly. So the skull is suspended by the vertebral column. So lateral view, anterior view, and the posterior view of the skull and the vertebral column. The vertebral column is also called the spine or the backbone or the spinal column. It makes up about two-fifths of your total height and is composed of a series of bones that we call vertebrae. The vertebral column, the sternum, we're going to see the sternum, the ribs form the skeleton of the trunk of the body. The vertebral column consists of bone and connective tissue. The spinal cord that it surrounds, so the vertebral column surrounds the spinal cord and protects, consists of nervous tissue and connective tissue. At about 71 centimeters in an average adult male and about 61 centimeters in an adult female. So the vertebral column is about 71 centimeters in males and 61 centimeters in females. It functions as a strong, flexible road with elements that can move forward, backwards, and sideways, and rotate. Okay. So these are the components of the vertebral column. The first component is called, is called the cervical vertebrae column. And then this is the thoracic vertebrae. This is the lumbar vertebrae, and this is called the sacrococcygeal vertebrae. This is very important to know. So the vertebral column is not straight. It is curved. So the cervical has this curve here. The thorax has. The thoracic has got a concave. This one, convex. So this one, convex uh, inward, convex outward, convex inside, convex outward. So the vertebral column is not straight at all. The vertebral curvature is here, thoracic curvature, lumbar curvature, sacrococcygeal curvature. There are seven cervical vertebra, four thoracic vertebra, five lumbar vertebra, and there are five fused sacro vertebra and four fused occidual vertebra. So now, if you have deformities in your vertebral column, you have these conditions called scoriosis, where your vertebra is curved laterally, like this. Okay, this is scoriosis. And then kyphosis is where you have very big curvature, convex curvature at the thoracic vertebra. Okay, so it's supposed to be at an angle, but not very prominent. If you saw the very big on your thoracic vertebra that is called kyphosis. Lordosis is where you have a very big curvature inward of your lumbar vertebra. It's very important to know this clinical polaris. So in addition to enclosing and protecting the spinal cord, it supports the head and serves as a point of attachment for the ribs, the pelvic guido, and the muscles of the back and the upper limbs. The total number of vertebrae during early development is 33. So as a, as a child grows, several vertebrae in the sacro and coccygeal regions fuse. 
As a result, the adult vertebral column typically contains 26 vertebrae. So what you're supposed to take away from this is that when a baby is born, they're 33. But as you grow as an adult, some of them fuse and they are only 26 vertebrae. The vertebrae regions contains uh, the cervical region, the thoracic region, the lumbar region, and the sacrococcygeal region. So now let's look at these regions uh, in detail. The cervical region is the superior most region, the first part of the vertebral column. It contains seven cervical vertebrae, named C1 to C7. Now, C1 and C2 are what we call a typical vertebra because they deviate from the normal structure of most vertebra. Okay, so we're going to look at them in detail. C1 is called the atlas. The, region, the reason why C1 is called the atlas is because it holds the head. It suspends the head. C2 is called the axis because that's where the head rotation happens. So it's the axis, the pivot where the skull can rotate. Okay. So this is C1, this schematic diagram, C1, which is called the atlas. C2 is called the axis. So this is the atypical vertebrae of C1, which is called the atlas, and C2, which is called the axis. They have got very unique anatomical features, and every medical student needs to know how to identify these two, these two vertebrae. Okay, so the atlas has got no spinous process. Okay. And it has a very large vertebral foramen. See, this is a very vertebral foramen. It has superior articular facets. These superior articular facets are very wide. And this is a transverse foramen. The transverse foramen are very small. The axis, it has this process. This process is where the skull attaches and it rotates. This is called the odd point process or the dens. The dense and it has got a bifid spinous process. So these two vertebrae are what we call a typical vertebrae, and they have very unique anatomical features. So this is the cervical vertebrae from C1. This is the atlas. C2. This is called the axis. C3, C4, C5, C6. C7 is called the vertebrae prominence because at your neck when you flex your head forward the vertebrae that you are able to feel the spinous process of the vertebrae that you are able to feel is the spinous process of c7 it has a very large spinous process this is what we call the vertebrae prominence so c7 is also referred to as the vertebrae prominence now let's look at the thoracic vertebrae. This vertebrae contains 12 vertebrae. From T1 to T12. The unique feature about thoracic vertebrae is that these have got costal facets where ribs attach. So this is a typical structure of a costal of the thoracic vertebrae. It has these transverse processes. These fun transverse processes have got these facets. The facets are where your ribs attach. Okay. So ribs attach here. Transverse process, ribs attach here. This is a spinous process. Okay. And then this is the pedicle. This is the vertebral body. Vertebral body is the one that forms the vertebral column. So this, this part here that converse, conversely uh, caves outwardly that has got two vertebrae is what we call the thoracic vertebral column. Look, let's look at the lumbar vertebral column. This contains five vertebrae from A1 
five. They are the largest vertebrae that carry the body weight. These are the largest vertebrae. One clinical color rate that is very important is that between L3 and L4, that's where you do the lumbar puncture. The lumbar puncture. Where you get CSF from the vertebral canal, where the spinal cord is found. That's where you find CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, for diagnosis of disease and for other therapeutic uh, administration of pharmacological agents like drugs. So these are the largest vertebrae in the body, which are the lumbar vertebrae. One thing that must be noted is that between vertebrates, there are what we call intervertebral discs. And these intervertebral discs are made of fibrocartilage. So at this point, you've already done cartilage in class, the type of cartilage that is found between vertebrae of the vertebral column is the fibrocartilage. Now let's look at the sacral and the coccygeal vertebrae even as we conclude the vertebral column. The sacrum is the triangular bone formed by the union of five sacral vertebrae. The narrow inferior portion of the sacrum is known as the apex. The broad superior portion of the sacrum is called the base. So the foramens at both surfaces, the, both the anterior and the posterior surfaces of the sacrum. The coccyx is found inferior to the sacrum and it is also triangular shaped and it is formed by the fusion of usually four coccygeal vertebrae. In females, the coccyx points inferiorly to allow the passage of the baby during birth. In males, it points anteriorly. So this is a very uh, important difference between the coccyx in the females and in the males. It's a very good clinical colorate. So this is the sacrum. The anterior view of the sacrum. It has one, two, three, four, five fused vertebrae. And it has these foramens anteriorly and posteriorly. This is the, the apex of the sacrum. And this is the base of the sacrum. So this base articulates with the lumbar vertebrae, the fifth lumbar vertebrae. This is the posterior surface of the sacrum. This is the coccygeal vertebrae, which is made up of four fused vertebrae. In females, we say it, it points inferiorly. In males, it points anteriorly. Okay. So now, let's look at the anterior portion of the axoskeleton. So posteriorly, we had the vertebral column. Anteriorly, we have the sternum. The sternum is also called the, breast, the breastbone. It is a flat bone, narrow, located in the center of the anterior thoracic wall that measures about 15 centimeters or 6 inches. It has three parts. It has the superior part called the manubrium. Okay. And the junction of the manubrium and the body forms the sternal angle. So you have the manubrium and then the body. Between the manubrium and the body, you have the sternal angle. Let me just show you that. So this, these are the three parts of the manubrium. This is the, the three parts of the sternum, rather. This is the manubrium. Between, and this is the body in pink. Between the manubrium and the body, you have the sternal angle here. And then the last part of the manubrium is the xiphoid process. So, the manubrium has got this notch where the clavicle articulates and it has the notch for the first rib. The first rib. The second rib attaches at the joint between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. And then you have the facets for the four ribs. One, two, three, four. Here. All right. So that is the sternum. This shows us the detailed. Now, this is a clavicular notch where the clavicle attaches. This is a notch for the first rib, second rib, third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib, sixth rib, seventh rib. 
This is the xysteno joint which connects the body of the sternum to the xiphoid process. This is the breastbone. Thoracic bones, the ribs. Let's look at the ribs now. They are 12 pairs of ribs numbered from 1 to 12, from superior to inferior, which gives structural support to the sides of the thoracic cavity. The ribs increase in length from the first to the seventh rib, and then they decrease in length from the eighth to the twelfth rib. Each rib attaches posteriorly to the corresponding thoracic vertebrae. Remember, we said that the thoracic vertebrae are the ones that articulate with the ribs using the transverse processes. So, articulates posteriorly with the thoracic vertebrae. There are two types of ribs. There are typical and atypical ribs. There are also true and forcing ribs, protein True and false ribs and floating ribs. The spaces between ribs are what we call intercostal spaces, occupied by inner costal muscles. So between your ribs, your ribs, those spaces are what we call intercostal spaces, and those uh, intercostal spaces are occupied by intercostal muscles, blood vessels, and nerves. Surgical access to the lungs and other structures in the thoracic cavity. Is commonly obtained through the intercostal spaces. Let me just show you what I've been talking about. So these are the ribs. They articulate anteriorly to the breastbone here, which is called the sternum, and then posteriorly they go and articulate with the thoracic vertebrae. So this rib here and this rib, the space in between is what we call an intercostal space. The intercostal space is filled with muscles. Intercostal muscles, which contain blood vessels and, and nerves. So there's a neurovascular bundle beneath every uh, rib here. So for you to gain access to the thoracic cavity, you need to go through this intercostal space. Okay. So those are the ribs. Okay. So those are the ribs. Now, I want you to pay attention to these ribs that are behind here. Rib number 11 and 12. These are not attached to these cartilages here. So these ribs are what we call floating ribs. These are floating ribs. Floating ribs. Okay. Applied anatomy, we already talked about kyphosis, choreosis, lordosis. Spinal bifida is where you just have a part of your vertebrae that is open. So there is access to your spinal cord. Your ribs can fracture. That is what we call rib fracture. Your ribs can dislocate from the sternum or from the thoracic vertebrae of the vertebral column. Those are dislocated ribs. Right, so now we've done the actual skeleton in all its detail. Let's move on and look at the appendicular skeleton. So this is our appendicular skeleton. We said we had girdles and we had bones of the upper and the lower limb. So the girdle, the part, the bones that attach the upper limb to the axial skeleton is what we call the pectoral girdle. The giddle is made up of two bones, the clavicle and the scapula. Okay. The upper limbs are made up of the humerus, which is the long bone here. The, the humerus is the bone of the arm. And we've got the ulna and the radius, which are the bones of the forearm. The carpals, these are the bones of the wrist. The metacarpals, this is the bones, the bones of the hand. The phalanges are bones of the fingers. This guido that is attaching the lower limb to the vertebrae, the actual skeleton, is what we call the pelvic guido. 
the pelvic girdle is made up of a series of fused bones that we're going to look at. The lower limb is made up of the femur, which is the bone of the thigh, the femur. And then the bone of the leg, at the, the fibula and the tibia. The tibia. Okay. The fibula and the tibia. And then we've got bones of the foot, which are the tassels, the metatarsals, and the pharynges. So this is a, a schematic diagram just showing us the appendicular skeleton only highlighting the ghettos, the upper limb, the ghettos here, and the upper limb. So always know the ghetto that is attaching the upper limb to the midline skeleton, the exoskeleton, Gido. The gedo that is attaching the lower limbs to the actual skeleton, the pelvic gedo. Let's go on and look at these gedos, the pectoral gedo. So the pectoral gedo is also known as the shoulder gedo. It attaches the upper limb to the trunk, which is the actual skeleton. It consists of two bones, the clavicle and the scapula. Clavicles are what we call collar bones. They are slender, they are S-shaped, and they extend horizontally. I'll be showing you a diagram very soon illustrating the clavicle. It has a cone-shaped steno end and a flat acromion end. The middle two-thirds of the clavicle is convex anteriorly. So meaning it convinces anteriorly. It bends anteriorly. The lateral third is concave anteriorly. Okay, it bends away from the anterior. It has a smooth superior part and grooved or ridged inferior part. This is the clavicle. Okay. So we said it has a flat acromion end. The acromion end is where it goes and articulates with the scapula. And here on the sternal end, we said it is cone shaped. So this part here. This part is a sternal end. This is where I said it articulates with the manubrium of the sternum. Okay. So this is the superior part. We said it's very smooth. The inferior part has got grooves in it. Okay. So the features of the clavicle is that it has the trapezoid line and it has the conoid tubercle. So this is the clavicle. This is the trapezoid line. You can see it from the posterior aspect. And this is the conoid tubercle. This is the clavicle here. It is horizontal and it attaches medially to the manubrium of the breastbone, the sternum. Laterally, it attaches to the acromion, acromion of the scapula. So this joint is called the acromioclavicular joint. And this joint here is called the the manubrio clavicular joint or the stenoclavicular joint. Yeah. The clavicle joint, the clavicle bone, because it is horizontal, is easily injured. It's a very easily injured bone because of its position in the body. Now let's look at the second bone of the uh, pectoral gido, which is the scapula. The scapula are also known shoulder blades they are thin triangular flat bones located on the back of the rib so on the dorsal surface of the rib the features is that they have the granoid fossa the coracoid process suprascapular notch spine of the scapula the acromion infraspinous fossa supraspinous fossa subscapular fossa so this is a spina this is a scapula this is the anterior aspect of the scapula it's triangular shaped as you can see this is the subscapular fossa this is a medial border lateral border inferior angle so it has the acromion here where the clavicle goes and attached it has the coracoid process it's an attachment for so many muscles it has the suprascapular notch where so many tendons of muscles and blood vessels pass it has the superior border here 
this is the granoid cavity. The granoid cavity is where the head of the humerus comes to join here so that it can form the shoulder joint. Remember, granoid cavity of the scapula is where the head of the humerus will come and join to form the shoulder joint. On the posterior aspect, we can appreciate the spine. Now, above the spine is what we call supraspinous, supraspinous fossa because it is above the spine. Supra means above, so supraspinous fossa. This is the infraspinous fossa. These are attachment points for so many muscles in the body. This is a coracoid process here. So this is the scapula. Now, let's move on to the bones of the upper limb. There are 30 bones in the upper limb. 30. So the upper limb is grouped. The bones of the upper limb are grouped into the bones of the arm, the forearm, and the hand. So let me show you the positioning. The arm is also known as the brachium. It is between the shoulder and the elbow joint. That is the position of the arm. The humerus is the only bone of the arm. It is the largest and longest bone in the upper limb. The proximal end of the humerus has the following features. The head, the neck, the greater and lesser tubercles, intertubercular line, the sulcus, which is also called the bicipital groove, the deltoid tubercle, and the radial tubercle. The distal end of the humerus has got the following features. The trochlea, the capitulum, the medial and lateral epicondyles, the medial and lateral supraepicondylar ridges, the olecranon fossa, colonoid fossa, radial fossa. This is the humerus. The longest and only bone of the arm. So we said it has the head here. It has got the greater tubercle, the lesser tubercle this side. This is the, the neck of the humerus. This is the surgical neck, the anatomical neck, surgical neck. Here inferiorly, it has the olacronen, olacroneno, olacrenon fossa, lateral epicondyl, medial epicondyl, the capitulum, the trochlea. These here are what we call the supracondylar ridges. This is the anterior view. This is the posterior view, which will show you the deltoid tuberosity, where the deltoid muscle is going to attach. This is the intertubercular groove, where the tendon of nerve, the tendon of muscles and nerves will pass. So the greater tubercle is here, the lesser tubercle. Between these two, this is a groove. You can appreciate the colonoid fossa from the posterior aspect and the trochlea. This is the humerus. So all the anatomical parts of the humerus needs to be known because it's a very important bone. The forearm is also known as the antebrachium. It is made up of the ulna and the radius, two bones. The ulna and the radius articulate with the humerus proximally and the couple bones distally. In anatomical position, the radius is lateral. So the anatomical position is where your palm is facing upwards. The radius is lateral while the ulna is medial. The ulna is slightly long, longer than the radius. So this here are the two bones. So this is the radius, this is the ulna. They are touched by what we call the, the uh, onoradial joints. Okay, so the onoradial joints are touched here. Okay, so radio ulnar joint, this is at the distal end, radio ulnar joints, this is the proximal radio ulnar joints. The radius has got the head, the neck, the radio tuberosity, and it has got the styroid process. So what you need to know is that the, the radius is bigger distally 
and the ulna is bigger proximally. Okay. So these two bones are also held together by this membrane here that is called the interosseous membrane. So these are the two bones of the antebrachium or the forearm. Now the oracranon process is what will go and articulate with the with the humerus. So olacranon process will what will come and articulate in the olacranon fossa here of the humerus. Okay. So the olacranon process of the the ulna, the olacranon process here of the ulna will articulate with the olacranon fossa of the humerus. That's how the elbow joint is formed. Okay, so articulation of the lunate, articulation of the scaphoid steroid process here at the distal ends of the radius. Okay, so we're going to look at the lunate and uh, the scaphoid bones of the of the wrist joints that articulate with the processes in the radius here. Okay. So the ulna, let's look at these bones individually. The ulna is slightly longer than the radius. It has the following features. Olacranon process. We said the olacranon process will go articul articulate with the... The olacranon process will go articulate with the olacranon fossa of the humerus. The coronoid process here. Cochlear notch, radio notch, styroid notch. So these will go and articulate with the head of the, of the uh, this is the head of the owner that will go and articulate with the upper bones of the wrist bones. This is the anterior view, this is the lateral view of the owner. The radius is thin at its proximal end. So it's thin here, the proximal end, and wider at its distal end. Okay. It is the lateral bone of the forearm. In anatomical position, it is lateral. You should note the following features on the radius. The radial tuberosity, the ulnar notch, the head of the radius, and the neck of the radius. So there's the neck of the radius here, the head of the radius. The radial tuberosity articulates with the, the ulnar. So oh, those were the bones of the forearm. Now let's look at the bones of the hand. The hand includes the bones of the wrist, which is called the carpus, the metacarpus, which is the palm, and the phalanges, which are the fingers. So you need to know the bones of the, the hand. So these are the bones of the wrist. These are what we call these are what we call the couple bones. So we have the, the hermit, capitate, the trapezoid, the, the trapezium, scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrium. We need to know how all of these can be identified just by looking at them. These, jo these bones of the wrist connect to the bones of the palm, which are called the metacarpals. There are five metacarpals. So this is metacarpal one from the thumb. Go in this side. One, two, three, four, five. Five metacarpals. These metacarpals join with the phalanges. Phalanges are the bones of the fingers. So this uh, finger here, the, thing, the thumb has got two phalanges. It has the proximal phalange, the distal phalange. The rest of the fingers have got three phalanges. The proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, and the distal phalanx. So let's read this literature here. The carpus, which is the hand, contains eight bones called the carpals. Okay. So the wrist bones has got eight bones called the carpals. They are arranged in two irregular rows with each having four bones. So there are two rows here. One, two. And each of these contain Four bones. Proximal rose contains the scaffold. So 
the proximal row is this guy here. Paphoid, lunate, triquitrum, passiform, starting from the lateral end coming to the medial end. Scaphoid, lunate, triquitrum, passiform. The distal row, this one, starting from the lateral end going to the proximal end, it has the trapezium, the trapezoid, trapezoid, and the hermit. So all the bones of the wrist are very important. The cup, the metacarpals, there are five metacarpals. They're numbered one to five from the thumb to the little finger. So from the thumb here, one, two, three, four, five. So you don't start counting from the little finger. You start counting from the thumb. Thumb one, two, three, two, five. Okay. The phalanges are bones of the fingers they are one to five the thumb is also called the pollex except the pollex each finger has got three phalanges remember the thumb has got two phalanges and the other ones have got three the middle the proximal the middle and the distal while it's the thumb only has the the proximal and the distal phalanx okay so we are done with the upper limb now let's look at the skeleton of the pelvic giddle and we look at the lower limbs and we'll be done with the skeleton. The pelvic giddle, also known as the hip giddle, attaches the lower limb to the spine. It consists of the paired hip bones called the coxo or the coxiae. The pelvis is made up of the sacrum and the hip Bones. The hip bones is made up of three bones that unite. These are the pubis, the ischium, the ilium. The three bones unite in Adam and in adults at the acetabulum. So the acetabulum is where the head of the femur will come and articulate with the, the hip bone. Okay. So these are the giddle. It has the sacrum posteriorly, and it has this bone called the ilium. It's in paper. And then this is called the pubis. This is the ischium. Where the pubis bones meet, this is what we call the pubis symphysis. The pubis symphysis has got this fibrocartilage here that unites the two pubis bones. In real time images, this is what we mean. Sacrum posteriorly, this is lumbar vertebrae 5. This is the ilium, this is the pubis, and then this is the sacrum. Okay. So the pubis, this one here, have you seen this? This portion where the ilium, the pubis, the ischium are meeting is what we call the acetabulum. The acetabulum is where the bones of the thigh will come and articulate to form the hip joint now let's look at the three bones that form the the hip bone the ilium makes the superior most part of the hip bone it consists of the body the ala the iliac crest the tubercle the anterior superior iliac spine posterior superior iliac spine the anterior and posterior inferior iliac spines the greater sciatic notch the iliac notch Auricular surface, the accurate line. So this one here is the iliac crest. So this is the ilium, the bone called the ilium, the superior part of the hip bone. This is the iliac crest. This is the anterior superior iliac spine. This is the anterior inferior iliac spine. Posterior in superior iliac spine. Posterior inferior iliac spine. And it has gluteal lines. It has the superior gluteal line, the anterior gluteal line, and the posterior gluteal line. So you see this place here where the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis meet forms like a Y symbol. It's called the Mercedes Benz symbol. This is called the acetabulum. At the acetabulum, 
that's where the head of the femur will come and articulate to form the, the hip joint. The east arm, let's move on to the east arm. The east arm forms the posterior inferior surface of the hip bone. Let's note the following structures that the east arm has. It has the body, the ramus, the isospines, the lesser sciatic note, and the istiotuberosity. So this is the istiotuberosity here. This is the body. This is the istospine. This foramen is called the obturator foramen. Posteriorly, it is made up of the east arm. Anteriorly, it is made up of the ramus of the pubis. The pubis is also known as the pubic bone. It forms anterior region of the hip bone. Notice the following structures of the pubic bone. The superior and inferior rami, body of the pubis, pubic crest, crest and the pubic tubercle. So now, let's look at the divisions of the pelvis. So the pelvis are the hip bones that we were talking about. These hip bones form the pelvis. Okay. So this, so where the two pelvis, this line here, an imaginary line, where the superior part of the pelvic is, these are what we call the ilium bones. The superior part of the ilium bones, they call the ala of the ilium. And then the imaginary line here separates the pelvis into two. You've got the fourth pelvis and you've got the two pelvis. So the fourth pelvis is where you're connecting the superior most part of the, the sacrum to the pubic uh, symphysis. Okay. Going up, this part of the pelvis is the fourth pelvis. It is continuous with the abdomen. And then from the superior part, of the ilium, the sacrum, and the coccyx, from the coccyx to the inferior part of the pubic symphysis is what we call the true pelvis. In the true pelvis, that's where you find urinary and reproductive organs. Okay. Now let's compare the male and the female pelvis. The female pelvis is smoother, lighter, less prominent muscle. And ligament attachments and it's wider the pelvis for females is called the gynecoid pelvis but the pelvis for men is called the android pelvis so some of the different features is that this the pubic arch is less than 90 degrees in males in females it is greater than 90 degrees the pelvic inlet is less in males and it is wider in females. So that is the difference. And then these structures called the istospines are more prominent in men and in females they're not very prominent because if they are prominent they're going to obstruct labor. So they're less prominent in females for easy childbirth. We said the female pelvis, pelvic guido is larger than the male pelvic guido. The female pelvic guido is called the gynecoid pelvis. And then the male pelvis is called the android pelvis. Look at the different types of pelvic bones. They're very important, the pelvis. All right. Let's look at the lower limb, which is the last part of the skeleton, and will be done. So the thigh is the first part, the lower limb. The thigh, the femur, is the single most bone of the thigh. It is the largest, longest, and strongest bone of the body. Notice the following structures of the femur. It has the head, the neck, the greater and lesser trochanters, the intertrochanteric line, the gluteal tuberosity, the linear aspira, the lateral and medial condyles, the medial and lateral epicondyles. So this is the femur. The longest and strongest bone in the body. It has the head, 
the neck. This is the intratrochanteric line. The greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. This is the gluteal tuberosity, where your gluteal muscles will attach. And then it has a medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle. And it has the condyles as well. All right. And it has medial and lateral supracondylar ridges. These are medial and lateral supracondylar ridges. So those are the characteristics of the femur. Okay. So the thigh also has the, the patellar surface. So the patellar surface attaches to the patellar bone of the knee. This is the patella here. The patellar surface of the femur attaches to the patellar surface of the knee. The leg has got two bones. It has the tibia, which is a very large bone and strong bone, and it has the fibula. So the leg is made up of two parallel bones called the tibia and the fibula. And these are connected together by uh, the interosseous membrane. So between the fibula and the tibia, there is an interosseous membrane. The characteristics of the tibia is that it has a lateral condyle, the medial condyle. And it has the tibial tuberosity, where some of the muscles will come and insert here. It has also has the medial mariolus and the lateral mariolus. This joint between the fibula and the tibial is called the tibiofibular joint, proximally and distal, distally. Okay. Those are the characteristics of the fibula, the lateral bone of the leg. So you need to know that the tibia is medial to the fibula. The fibula has got the head of a fibula and it has the lateral mariolus. The medial mariolus is found on the tibia. The lateral mariolus is found on the fibula. Let's look at the foot. It includes the bones of the tarsus, the metatarsus, and the phalanges. So the foot, the tarsus here, where your ankle joint is, consists of seven individual bones, which include the talus, the calcaneus, cuboid, navula, uh, medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bones. So it has the talus, these are the bones of the foot, the talus, the calcaneus. The calcaneus make the the ankle. They make the ankle. This bone makes the ankle here. The calcaneus. has the cuboid, and then the navula, and it has the medial, the intermediate, and the lateral cuneiform. Seven bones. And then from the tassels, the tassels, you call them tassel bones, you have the metatassels. There are five. From the big to one, two, three, four, five. Just like the thumb, the big toe only has two phalanges, the proximal phalange and the distal phalange. And the rest of the toes have got three, the proximal, the middle, the distal. Proximal, middle, distal. Proximal, middle, distal. Proximal, middle, distal, phalanges. Okay. So we already talked about this. The metatarsals or the metatarsals have got five numbered from one five the phalanges have got 14 bones phalanges there are three phalanges in each toe proximal middle and distal phalanges except the big toe which is called the hallux which consists of only two phalanges so this has been the skeleton from head to toe i know it's a very long presentation but if you are able to remember all these bones in the body, then you are well and set for the skeleton. Thank you very much. Subscribe to our channel. Like, comment, and share. Let's medicine together. This is Dr. Bison Montali. I'll see you in the next video.